Earthing and bonding is a term that we often hear in the electrical industry. However, earthing and bonding are actually two different things. I'm James Kerno, and in this video, I'm gonna be asking the question, what is the difference between earthing and bonding? So first, let's have a look at earthing. If we look in part two of BIS 761, we can see that earthing is defined as connection of the exposed conductive parts of an installation to the main earthing terminal of that installation. And exposed conductive parts are defined as a conductive part of equipment which can be touched and which is not normally live, but which can become live under fault conditions. Regulation 411.3.1.1 states that exposed conductive parts shall be connected to a protective conductor under the specific conditions for each type of system of earthing as specified in sections 411.4 to 411.6. Also that conductors for protective earthing shall comply with chapter 54 in BS 76 M1. Examples of exposed conductive parts include things like metal wiring accessories, metal light fittings, metal bank boxes, appliances, uh, the metal casing of an appliance such as a cooker for example. Also the armour of an SWA cable is an exposed conductive part so even if it hasn't been used as a CPC it still needs to be earthed. So earthing exposed conductive parts is to provide protection against electric shock under fault conditions. So for example if the line conductor were to come into contact with a metal casing of an appliance the circuit protective conductor will provide a path for the current to flow to disconnect the protective device within the disconnection time and remove the danger. The requirements for earthing can be found in chapter 54 of BS 761. Now let's have a look at bonding. If we look again at part two of BS 761, you may notice that there isn't a definition for the word bonding, but we can see that equipotential bonding is defined as an electrical connection maintaining various exposed conductive parts and extraneous conductive parts at substantially the same potential. So what is an extraneous conductive part? An extraneous conductive part is defined in BS 76M1 as a conductive part liable to introduce a potential, generally earth potential, and not forming part of the installation. Regulation 411.3.1.2 states that in each consumer's installation within a building, extraneous conductive parts liable to introduce a dangerous potential difference shall be connected to the main earthing terminal by protective conductors complying with chapter 54. Examples of extraneous conductive parts include things like metal water pipes, metal gas pipes, structural steel, lightning protection conductors, oil heating pipes, and so on. The reason for bonding extraneous conductive parts is to ensure that there are no differences in potential between them under fault conditions. So if you imagine the incoming services in a typical house, let's say you have a TN electrical system which has an earthing arrangement provided by the DNO. Then you have an incoming water pipe and gas pipe, which are both metal. The metal pipes that come out of the ground will have the ability to introduce an earth potential. And so we bond them back to the main earthing terminal and this is to maintain exposed conductive parts and extraneous conductive parts at substantially the same potential. It's important to note that there are other examples of extraneous conductive parts other than those listed in BS 76M1 or on a condition report. For example, a conductive part that is common between more than one installation would be considered to be extraneous, such as communal heating pipe work that serves more than one property, for example. Also, other metal pipe work that is in contact with the general mass of earth would be extraneous. Now, I once had a situation where um, I was doing an inspection on a property and the incoming water main to the ground floor flat was bonded. However, there was a second pipe that came out of the ground and ran up the wall to the first floor flat above. The second pipe was the water main for the flat above, and this was also an extraneous conductive part, firstly because it was in contact with the general mass of earth, and secondly because it passed through more than one property and was likely connected to the earthing arrangements for the flat above. So this is an example of an extraneous conductive part that may not be obvious at first, and so it is important to remember the difference between earthing and bonding when determining where we need to apply protective bonding. The requirements for protective bonding can be found in chapter 54 of BSM 6M1, and there are different requirements for different types of earthing system, so be sure to check that out. So to recap, earthing is provided to exposed conductive parts, which are part of the electrical insulation, and equipotential bonding is provided to extraneous conductive parts, which are not part of the electrical insulation. This is to ensure that both exposed and extraneous conductive parts are at substantially the same potential. At this point, I think it would be a good idea for me to mention supplementary bonding, which is slightly different. 
Supplementary air potential bonding is a method of providing additional protection against electric shock, and supplementary bonding is applied to both exposed and extraneous conductive parts. And the requirements for this can be found in Regulation 415.2 and in Part 7 of BS 7671 for special locations. Now, if you're an older Sparky like me, you will know that supplementary bonding is something that has changed quite a lot over the years. And you'll remember that supplementary bonding is something that we always had to install to bathrooms and shower rooms until a previous change to section 701 for rooms containing a bath or shower, which permitted supplementary bonding to be emitted in locations containing a bath or shower, as long as circuits complied with the disconnection time, RCD protection is installed and extraneous conductive parts are connected to the protective air potential bonding. However, it's important to note that supplementary bonding is still included in BS 761 and there are some special locations where supplementary bonding cannot be emitted. For example, supplementary bonding is required in swimming pools and other basins, agricultural and horticultural premises, conducting locations with restricted movement, medical locations and temporary electrical installations for structures, amusement devices and booths at fairgrounds, amusement parks and circuses to give just a few examples. My advice is that if you know that you're going to be working somewhere that is a special location in BS 761, have a read of part seven for special locations. Now staying on the subject of bonding, in a previous video here on the eFix channel, Joe Robinson asked the question, should I bond a ceiling grid? And if you haven't seen that video, please see that after this video. Thanks for watching.